So an art project you, of mine you might have heard of, and I think I actually spoke about this at DataFest in 2017, it's called Oddity Viz. It's a collaboration with Valentina de Filippo, and it visualises musical data from David Bowie's song Space Oddity on a series of 10 engraved records with accompanying posters and animation. Continuing the musical theme, I'm currently working with Duncan Gear, who I believe is giving a workshop this afternoon on P5, so you should definitely all go to that. And it's a new a data sonification podcast, and it's called Loud Numbers. And we're aiming to release the podcast in the first half of 2021. So each episode, we'll take a different data set and we'll turn it into a musical track. And I'm Stephanie. Uh, I'm a London-based information designer, artist, and author, and I mainly work on creating experimental data design projects. Um, a project of mine that some may have heard of is Dear Data, a year-long project with Georgia Lupi, where every week we collected our personal data and drew it on a postcard to send to the other. And this project culminated in a book and journal, and then the postcards and sketchbooks that form the project are held in the permanent collection of MoMA in New York. And at the moment, I'm an artist in residence with People Like You, a UK research group exploring data personalization. And my focus is personalized medicine. And through my art practice, I'm researching how people who work with the biobanks, big data, perceive the people behind the numbers who consent to their biological samples and data being used and stored in this way. And I'm using drawing as a way of understanding and figuring out this process. As for me and Mir Miriam, I guess the best way to describe it is that we're friends who drink together and also do data together. Uh, we first started working together professionally around 2012. And so here's this very youthful picture of us from that time celebrating the publication of a spread we created for Wired UK magazine. Um, since these early days though, our collaborations have moved more towards art commissions, museum installations and publishing books together. So what defines our approach and what makes it special? Our shared practice is playful, it's multi-sensory and it's often accessible to all ages. And we like to create not just data-driven things but meaningful data experiences like these data necklaces that you can touch and you can wear. And these were part of a project called Air Transformed. This was an art commission where we explored how to communicate open air quality data from Sheffield in the UK in a memorable way that people could physically experience for themselves. So these three ne necklaces represent three weeks of data on PM10 levels, particulate matter. And these three pairs of glasses communicate three days of pollution in Sheffield. So the more polluted the air that day, the larger the patterns that are etched on the lenses. So that for the wearer, these patterns blur together, making the vision more or less hazy, depending on the air quality that day. Secondly, our relationship with data is often quite a flexible one, with data serving as both structure and inspiration. So an example of that is this project, which is called Sleep Songs. And in this project, we use sensors to measure our own breathing rate and our husband's over a night's sleep. And we transform the data into two different artworks. Stephanie created this large scale visual artwork, which represents the fluctuations in our breathing rate over the course of the night as these stitch like patterns with two breath blankets that allude to how our shared breath wraps around us as we sleep. And I used exactly the same data to write two pieces for Seven Park Choir, which were recorded by musicians from Durham University. Each five minute song represents a night of breathing data for a different couple, where the changing rhythms re reflect changes in our breathing rate over the six to eight hours we spent asleep. So the data creates the musical structure, but I also use the rhythms created as a kind of starting point for free composition. So the data didn't just shape the music, it also inspired its character. Finally, an important part of our shared practice is that we aim to speak to new, new audiences by moving beyond traditional data viz aesthetics. And we believe that warm, emotive and playful data projects often attract more engagement than one might attract if the end result was abstract, clinical and algorithmic. An example of this way of working was at the National Maritime Museum in Greenwich, London, where for six months last year, I was the artist in residence exploring how to use data as a way to listen to visitors and commemorate their experiences. Miriam collaborated with me on the data collection where we collected a mixture of basic demographic and personality data from visitors. And then I worked with this data to create playful ships badges that reference the coat of arms found on Royal Navy ships in order to celebrate 
the visitor fleet of families, tourists, and school children that floated through the museum. Here, it made sense to use this friendly, child-focused approach to rendering the data to speak to the primarily younger and family audience it was collected from. Our work can also be more straightforward and informative, but it's still always guided by a warmer and more accessible approach. An example is this information graphic, which is called Vaccine Confidence Cascade. And it imagines the thought processes of parents who must decide whether to allow their children to be vaccinated against HPV, the human papilloma virus, and illustrates them as a, flow, as a flowing river. As the parents encounter conflicting information and read media scare stories, the river becomes diverted by these uh, rocks. And in the end, actually 99% of parents fail to vaccinate over unfounded safety fears. And this scenario actually happened in Japan a few years ago. Vaccine Confidence Cascade is now a permanent part of the Welcome Collection in London. How do we work together when creating these projects? So when collaborating together, we have this kind of natural division of labour where I oversee all aspects of the content and the data, including research, um, data analysis, copywriting and fact checking. And then I oversee all aspects of design from designing the usually custom visualisation method we're working with and then the general creative direction of the project and other aspects of design like material research, graphic design, print production, and so on. However, where our two separate areas of expertise meet is in the creation of the overarching concept for our creative project, and we both have an input into this. We make sure we get the concept right before we do anything else. This approach is obviously different than how you would approach a traditional data vis project where the data comes first, but we're working with data in a different way here, using it to communicate a message or create a feeling that is often more subjective and personal. So because of this, our concept is often quite abstract or metaphorical or quite emotional. And we both work really, really hard to clarify what the concept is at every stage of the process. So that though we, we both do very different things, we're both starting from the same fundamental idea. The concept always comes first. And another thing that we feel is integral to how we collaborate is that we see both design and data research as inherently creative roles. So that when we work together, our tasks are so integrated and so focused on the concept that we've agreed on, that we both end up playing an equal part in shaping the outcome. Now, after seeing our practice, uh, some of you might be thinking, well, these projects <laughs> that you're showing aren't really scalable for enterprise. But why are these experimental data projects so important? Well. Firstly, effective data viz needs to reach and engage broad audiences more than ever. But the ways in which we communicate are constantly changing and there's always potential for new te technologies like VR, AR and more to become mainstream modes of content consumption. For example, the transition away from flat graphics towards 3D virtual spaces is already underway. So there's huge benefit in understanding how data can best be communicated in real world 3D settings and using all the senses. Also, thinking only of flat screen-based screen graphics can be limiting when representing data. Experimentation with physical data objects or sculptures, data sonification and other artistic data-driven forms on the edges of the data design space ultimately shape the practice at its center. Our world isn't static and so visualization shouldn't be static either. So how do we ensure we're always approaching these new opportunities with a spirit of openness, creativity and experimentation? So we believe that you can learn to experiment regardless of your place within the field of data visualization. It's a little bit like in the last talk, um, there, was, there was talk of learning to be creative, which I think is a lovely idea. So and in today's talk, we'll be sharing some of the strategies that we use when making these creative projects that can be applied to all data viz practices from charts to data art. And we'll be outlining these strategies using our most recent project, which is I'm a book, I'm a portal to the universe. And it was recently published in the UK by particular books who are in print. So today we'll be sharing a little bit more about this book, along with the creative process that we use to make it. Our first strategy is if you're bored, try something new. So if you find that you're endlessly repeating yourself with your charts or your data viz approaches, now is the time to try something different, however small. Um, we find that boredom can be a great motivator. So we were actually feeling quite bored when we came up with our book idea and um, we were sitting in South London in the spring of 2018 in a cafe and we were chatting about how bored we were with charts and infographics and data viz and how we wanted to do something different. So you could say that we were suffering from chart fatigue, but where did this chart fatigue come from? Um, well, I'll start and I'll say from a designer's perspective. So 
as a designer, working with data inherently places limitations on its visual output, which makes sense because the data, of course, must shape its form. But it can be tiring as a designer to pull the same underlying design structures off the peg and use them over and over within your design solution. As someone who comes from a communication design background, this can feel counterintuitive to me as in my field of design, a central goal is to continually develop new visual and conceptual approaches. Of course, you can develop new aesthetic representations of data, but it can still sometimes feel like a Sisyphean task um, because there are always these natural forms that, that the data will tend to take. And um, I was also once a book cover designer where this, the goal is to quickly communicate a book's concept in a clever and visually arresting way. But when we're working with data, I miss this ability to create visual concepts that go beyond just using carrots to represent carrot data or emojis to represent emoji data, but have witty and playful concepts at its core that create as Beryl McAlhone and David Stewart call it, a smile in the mind. Um, I find wit and humor in data viz is often driven by the data journalist or researcher as opposed to the designer who again is inherently constrained by the data. From my perspective as a data journalist, I love charts and I use them a lot, but there is a caveat to this because charts can seem to encapsulate absolutely everything about a topic. They can sometimes make it seem like that's all there is to know about it. And they can also introduce a degree of distance from what they represent or a kind of false objectivity. And this is what the philosopher Donna Haraway called, um, quote, the God trick of seeing everything from nowhere, close quote, which I really like that quote. So, for example, this chart, um, it's just taken from Statista, it shows the number of endangered species is rising, and sadly this is true, but on further investigation, the chart only just includes uh, just over 100,000 species assessed by the IUCN, and this is a tiny fraction of the millions or perhaps billions of species that are actually out there. So the truth is we don't know how many species are living on this planet, not for sure. Uh, we just have estimates. So this is an argument for reading the small print charts, yes, but more fundamentally it points to the fact that charts give a partial perspective that's very easily mistaken for a complete one. Personally, I'm interested in using data to create immersion in a subject rather than separation from it. And I get excited by original types of data visualization that inspire a more emotional engagement with the topic than traditional chart types often do. Like these poignant data portraits of endangered species by Reddit user White Cheeks. Each dot in the portrait represents a single animal. And as the population numbers rise and fall, the image will either become more legible or it will disappear completely. So together with Stephanie, I started thinking about how you might communicate data in ways that are more direct and less abstract than charts. Our chart fatigue meant we also grew weary of well-worn formats such as the infographic book, an innovative format a decade ago that's completely transformed the data design landscape and one which we've both worked on in the past, but one that's long since been superseded by online graphics. But we still love books, so we asked ourselves, how can we make something different than the standard info book? And what sort of project would make us excited about data again? With all of these thoughts in mind, we began to brainstorm new ideas for collaboration while dancing my baby to sleep in a cafe, and we came up with our super book idea. What if we made a book where the book itself is the measuring device? So we began to develop the general concept. The book itself is a measuring device that can be used to measure things, and our working title was The Measuring Book. Next, it's a book for almost everyone from children aged eight and up to adults. And our goal was to write for the data uninitiated or data intimidated, people who would normally pick up a book with data or science in the title. We wanted the book to be accessible enough for children, but entertaining enough for adults with a bit of bite and humor to it. And finally, our golden rule and biggest constraint, all the data should be represented on a one-to-one -one scale printed on the page at actual size. Putting these constraints down so early in the process was quite nerve wracking, but it did force us to innovate. So our second strategy is treat constraints as a creative challenge. You can use your project constraints to your advantage and setting tight rules can often push your practice in new, di new directions. So an example of that is that our golden rule with the book that everything should be on a one to one scale led us to explore ways of communicating quantities using physical interactions like wearing the book as a hat and using your tongue as a measuring device that as far as, far as we know anyway, uh, not been attempted before. 
And so applying this more broadly, whether you're creating data art, a dashboard or a chart for a presentation, the completely different constraints across these areas provide different jumping off points for clever data communication solutions. Back to our book. From our starting point constraints, we developed a more fleshed out concept and a narrative vision. And we realized quite early on that the book should speak directly to the reader in the first person and have a strong personality, which is kind of fun, kind of playful, sometimes a little arrogant. And we're calling it a love letter to the universe. So a book tells you stories about a universe that is, is dynamic, it's constantly moving and changing, in which everything is connected to everything else, full of millions or billions of living organisms and countless mysterious or elusive things flying through us or away from us. So an example of that is this spread, which estimates that based on the book's volume, there are probably about 187,000 relic neutrinos passing through it at any one time. So relic neutrinos are subatomic particles. Um, they're left over from the first moments after the Big Bang, and they're very, very hard to detect. So by being a measuring device, the book is like a portal to the world around you, through which you can see things that were previously invisible. So it is a scientific book. Um, but it's also, it's a story for both adults and children. In this spread, the book flies to the moon where it gathers a blanket of moon dust as thick as one of its own pages. And in reality, this would take around 200 years. I calculated this number based on measurements of moon dust dep deposition over time taken from actual lunar missions. And Stephanie sampled the gray color of the moon from a photo of its surface. But there's magic too, as well as the science after all, the talking book is flying to the moon. So we settled for a balance between fact and fantasy that we decided to call data-driven magic realism. So that, this means that all the numbers are as accurate as I could get them and based on peer-reviewed scientific research where possible. But the book is also full of thought experiments and what ifs. So what if there were air in space or what if a book could talk? It goes off on these like flights of fantasy about what would happen if the, if the book were made of water or if it made of plutonium or if it were orbiting the earth covered in solar panels. In our original proposal that we sent to publishers, we outlined the book that we'd like to make and we described our influences, which were data viz or infographic books, uh, popular science books with a playful edge, design led books that are user books core components to tell a story and interactive picture books. But the book that we actually made doesn't fall neatly into any of these categories. So our third strategy is look outside your field for inspiration. By looking outside the field of data viz and mixing genres and influences, we created a unique book that no one else could have made. But we made sure our experiment in magic realism was grounded in facts, like I said. So our goal was really to make scientific ideas accessible and, and approachable for readers of all ages. And we tried to include concepts that weren't common knowledge, but that anyone could potentially grasp with a few sort of mind bending facts thrown in for good measure as well. So an example of that is this spread, which is about the bizarre consequences of uh, relativity, as in the theory of relativity. So the book tells you that if you, you stood it upright on a table, time would actually pass a tiny fraction of a second slower at the bottom of the page than the top of the page because it is closer to the Earth's centre of gravity. And we wanted everything to be fully referenced. This is what we call the small print. It's a big appendix at the back of the book, about 10 pages, I think, where we explain all the background, all the calculations and all the assumptions behind each spread. So those are the basic narrative ideas, but uh, how do we visualize the data? Well, first we put firm design rules into place from the beginning, the main one being no traditional charts or graphics allowed. We had an absolute ban on bar and line charts, axis labels, and so on. So there were none of the trappings of a traditional info book. And were we worried about working within such a strict set of rules? Well, actually, no, we weren't because of our fourth strategy, which was that we both believe that virtually anything in the world can be a variable that communicates data. Stones, plants, pasta, walking, singing, skipping, if you spend a bit of time with any material, you can begin to find ways of using it to encode data. With our book, we made the rule that it would only communicate its data using what we're calling its superpower. So it's ink, pages, typeface, cover, binding, and more. And so we would use these variables to represent meaningful data in as many magical, clever, and witty ways we could think of. So an example of how this might work can be seen 
where, well, at least for the English translation, we try to create a witty, playful smile in the mind by using the double O's within relevant words to represent to scale the actual size of various animals' eyes in a spread alluding to the decreasing letter size of the standard eye test. Another key part of the design is that it would be one where the physicality of the book was embraced and interaction was integral to understanding data concepts where you might have to hold the book in the air or put it on the ground, drop it from waist height, snap it shut, wear as a hat. So this is not an ebook and it never will be. And then finally, we wanted the book to celebrate the power of print and the joy of typography by using lots of inky full bleed color gradients, and also using our typeface, not just to communicate text, but also as an illustrative device. So that's all quite a brief. Um, so how do we make that happen? Well, we started with our fifth strategy. Uh, we tested our materials to their limits. This is something we do in every project, and it's a vital part of any data viz or design practice, regardless of whether you're working in clay, working with a book, or working with Tableau. Using Tableau as an example, testing your materials in a digital sense means taking the time to understand all of the different tools and techniques that are available within the software. By looking beyond your standard workflows, you might discover a tool that you've never used before that can help you reach an effective and innovative data solution that was previously out of your grasp. For us, in order to fully test our material, our book, we fix its specification, so its dimensions, paper, cover finishes, number of pages. Um, we fix these with our publisher very early on, and then they made us blank dummy books um, with these specs that we could then work with while we develop the content. With this, we flip the normal book production process on its head, since these decisions normally come later in the process or at the end. With this dummy in hand, we started by brainstorming all the ways of communicating data using its form. So these in effect were our visual variables. And so we were carefully measuring and expecting every component and interacting with it, bending the pages, wearing it as a hat while chatting to each other virtually. And so through this, we started to find the beginnings of ideas. Now, this is not to say that this ideation process was easy by any means, but we just try to be as comprehensive and methodical as we can when experimenting with materials and form, accepting that, as in this chart I once drew, that it takes time and patience to slog through the rubbish and not so good ideas to get to the good ones. So once we had tested our materials and brainstormed all our, our visual variables, we looked for interesting measurements that were around the same size as the book, following our one to one scale rule. So, for example, this might be lengths that were between uh, 0.1 millimetres, and that's the human egg size dot on the end of the arrow uh, on the left hand spread, which you probably can't quite see. And 20 centimetres, that's the height and width of the book, it's a square book, and it's also the diameter of the grey circle on the right, which represents one giant single celled organism, again all to scale. Then I researched the most promising of these ideas and we built up the narrative spread by spread. We kind of pieced these spreads together, we sort of swapped them around and we tweaked the copy and tweaked the designs until they made a, a coherent journey that was led by the book. So the whole process was really collaborative. Uh, with concept, research, writing, design, all very, very sort of integrated. Uh, we used a lot of Slack, we used a lot of Google Docs. Um, probably the best way to describe it is that we are sort of riffing our feature there with both of us starting the process in different ways. So Stephanie might start with creative ideation and handling the book itself. And she might say something like, uh, what if we turn the book into a beak to represent the size of birds' beaks in proportion to their heads? And I would go away and look for that data. Unfortunately, I couldn't find that data, but we did end up with a very comparable spread using tongue lengths of various insects and other animals um, to compare to the reader's tongue. So I might try, um, I might start the process myself based on something that I was interested in finding out personally, like how far are cities moving apart or closer together each year because of tectonic plate movement. Or I'd start from the visual variable and I suggest, uh, is there a way that we can use text height to show sea level rise over time, for example. 
And we had quite a lot of strange moments as part of the book design and development process. As part of the research for this spread, I watched lots of YouTube videos on paper and ink manufacturing processes. And I fired out long lists of questions to printers and paper suppliers like about things like which tree species went into making this paper or where did the forests grow and how long did the trees live for before being harvested for pulp? And um, to be honest, I didn't get a lot of answers back because a lot of this information is commercially protected and so they don't want to give it away. Uh, but we did learn enough to find out how much wood likely went into making the book. And the answer was just under 300 grams of wood per copy. And along the way, there was also some drama over the book's weight. Because the facts we could include in the book were obviously based on its measurements, we needed to come up with an estimate for its weight early on that was reasonably accurate, allowing for some variation between copies and round it to the nearest 10 grams, just for simplicity. So this was a bit of a two year saga it involved weighing two versions of the dummy books that we had several times on kitchen scales in different, several different people's kitchens, just to allow for variability of the scales and redoing the calculations in the book at least twice before for the published version of the book, we finally settled on the same weight as our original estimate, which was 450 grams. So after doing all of this, uh... At the end of all of this, we finally had the res finished result in our hands, then we could enjoy its bold printed colors in person. And so this is this is what it looks like. Um, now, uh, through this process, uh, besides weighing the book a lot, um, some of our ideas went through many, many different design iterations, like the spread on the number of calories contained in the book if you were to eat it, which unsurprisingly would be a terrible idea, um, where this was the rough concept in our book proposal. And then this is a selection of 40 plus iterations I made while trying to get this final spread uh, right. Um, and then after that exhausting exploration, this is what the finished spread ended up looking like. Um, whereas other spreads didn't really change much at all as we hit upon the right design solution very early. So like the spread on how much the book would weigh on the moon, on Jupiter, and on a neutron star, where the force of gravity would be so strong that it would rip both the book and the reader into long streams of matter. So this is a process scientifically known as spaghettification. And this is the spread from our original pro proposal to publishers, and this is the spread in the final book. So this typographic approach to representing the reader's spaghettification felt like the right visual tone as anything else uh, might be verging on being a little too gory for a general audience. And uh, the ultimate win for us for, you know, at the end of this process is that the word data isn't anywhere in the book except for our bios on the second to last page where it couldn't be helped. So after two and a half years of hard work from initial idea in a cafe to final publication, did we actually succeed in making a book that went beyond the usual info book? Um, well, the reviews are coming in from some of the best and brightest, and they're looking really positive. And uh, some of the best news of all is that it's one of Financial Times' best books of the year 2020, and so that's something that we're really proud of. Um, as for the final printed weight of the book, uh, well, the published weight of 450 grams isn't quite right. On final weigh-in, our books average around 435 grams. And what did, what did we learn from this? Well. We learned it's pointless trying to be too precise when working with variable materials, especially as book printers are actually allowed to be off by one to two millimeters when trimming and binding pages due to the inherent imprecision of the mechanical process. We could have continued weighing books forever, trying to get it as close as possible, but you know, we had a submission deadline. A finished book is better than a perfect one, and so our last strategy is when it's done, stop. Done is better than perfect. So to sum this talk up, data visualization is an incredibly broad spectrum. From dashboards to data are all of these areas work together to move this field forward for different audiences in different ways. So don't be intimidated by chart rules. So just consider the context in which your data will be presented, strive to present it in an honest, transparent way, have a good reason for all of your decisions and experiment. An open approach to making data viz is more intuitive and enjoyable than one that is heavily rule based. Finally, this book shows that even within mass market publishing, even using the traditional form of the book, even using non digital methods, there's always scope to find completely new approaches to communicating data and information. So don't be afraid to take a chart one step further, even if it's just a small step and experiment. 
And we'd like to end this talk with a quick message from our book. It says, follow me. Uh, here is its website and here is its social media handles. It's on Twitter and Instagram and it does like to talk back. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Thank you. Thank you.